Well, hello. I'm so honored to be here. And uh, I've been here about a week enjoying the California sun. And it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful state, really. Um, OK, so we better get going, because I have a lot of slides to show you. There's um, nutrition is a very broad area. And so um, it was quite challenging to get it boiled down into just one talk. Um, so I'm going to give an overview. And first of all, I will identify the nutrients that are important in cognitive aging and risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. I'll describe the evidence. And I look at all of studies that are um, thought to be of high caliber. Um, I will also tell you some of the issues that are very important for interpreting the studies, one from the other, and why they might not agree. And uh, finally, we'll, I'll describe the dietary foods and patterns that may protect the brain. So um, you probably, in other lectures, I didn't put very much in my lecture about Alzheimer's disease because I was hoping that you already knew um, some of the basics. Um, but what we do in our site at Chicago is we have studies where we uh, recruit people who are free of dementia. They don't have um, dementia at the onset. And we uh, collect all sorts of information on them, including diet. And then we follow them over a long period of time, measuring their cognition over many years to see who declines and who doesn't, and also um, evaluate them from, for Alzheimer's disease. So we can relate diet in relation to decline and also for the development of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so the studies that I will be presenting and the nutrients that I will be presenting, what is um, basic to all of them is that they have a strong biologic mechanism by which um, it would, um, there's evidence that they should be involved in um, uh, dementia. Um, I've chosen nutrients that have pretty broad animal models. Now, animal models, they're different than humans, yes, but you can control everything in their environment. So they also offer another important piece of information. And then I've only included what we call prospective epidemiological studies. So um, that is where you collect information in people who are free of dementia and then relate it to people who develop dementia. So that's prospective in nature. So you know that the diet and the diet patterns come before the disease. So I'm not going to be introducing any other types of studies except for one isolated case, and I'll tell you why. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about any randomized trials that have been done. Now, randomized trials are normally thought of to be the golden Cadillac, if you will, the, the, the primo type of study to do, because you randomly assign people to, to get a nutrient or not. So all of the things that sort of hang with good nutrition, healthy behaviors such as uh, more exercise, um, higher socioeconomic status, um, those are all randomly assigned to. Um, but in nutrition, new, uh, randomized trials maybe not be the, the best design for looking at nutrition. And we'll talk about that as well. So the nutrients and the dietary components that meet these criteria include antioxidant nutrients, fish, and fat composition, and some of the B vitamins. So here are the nutrients listed. Um, the top, top uh, left portion of the table um, shows those that have strong evidence. The dietary tocopherols, which are vitamin E, DHA, a type of omega-3 fatty acid, folate, and saturated fat um, being bad for you, and then good for you, a high ratio, high ratio of unsaturated to saturated fats in your diet. Um, those studies with limited evidence, um, that is, there might not be that many studies conducted thus far, um, so that there's not enough information to move them up into the strong category. 
but they're interesting and, and look promising. These include the carotenoids, and in particular beta carotene and lutein, flavonoids, vitamin D, trans fats, monounsaturated fat, and polyphenols. So I've listed in the other um, side of the column, along with each nutrient, some of the foods that are particularly rich in those nutrients. And um, you see a pattern here, nuts, oils, green leafy vegetables, um, fish, uh, berries, tea, chocolate, wine, um, and olive oil. So um, there's a basic principle of nutrition and physiological function that is very important to understand when you want to understand the literature on nutrition and disease. Um, and this is the principle. Um, so we have on the y-axis here um, a physical, or not physiological function, but yes, physiological function. It could be cognitive or physical function. Um, here we have 100%, here we have death, and then we have nutrient concentration or intake on your x-axis. And as you can see, it's not a linear association. There's a very wide range of uh, normal, or excuse me, moderate intake that has the highest optimum functioning. And then too little of the nutrient or too much of the nutrient can result in less optimal function or even toxicity or death. So that's something that I want you to remember. We'll keep coming back to this when I describe the literature. Just in case you don't believe me, um, this is a agricultural experiment from 1938. These are oat plants, and um, the, uh, they were grown in um, water supplemented with copper. So here's almost no copper, and then it gets gradually more and more copper, and you can see that principle. No copper in there, it's bad. Too much comp copper, it's also bad. So uh, the antioxidant nutrients, these include vitamin E, vitamin C, flavonoids, and carotenoids. Um, vitamin C is one of the most potent antioxidant nutrients there are. It resides right within the cell walls, and it's there to snatch up free radicals. These are singlet molecules of oxygen that can cause injury to the cell. Snatches them up right as they are generated. Um, vitamin C is less potent as an antioxidant nutrient, um, but also restores vitamin E to its antioxidant capacity. So there's a, a large animal literature that has focused on vitamin E in particular, more so than any other antioxidant nutrient. And um, this study is, th these studies are pretty consistent in showing um, that it protects the cells from DNA damage, um, lipid peroxidation, uh, beta amyloid deposition, that's um, one of the characteristics of Alzheimer's disease, um, and loss of neurons and neuroinflammation. So it has many um, important biologic mechanisms that would make it important for the brain. So here's one of the animal models um, that um, I wanted to show you. These are older uh, rodents that have been eight months on four different diets. We have the control diet. Uh, another diet was supplemented with strawberries, uh, which are high in C and flavonoids. Um, and then we have a synthetic vitamin E diet, uh, supplemented diet, and then spinach supplemented diet. And after eight months on the diet, the group that did the best was the um, spinach. That's uh, vitamin E and um, carotenoids and uh, some flavonoids. Um, spinach did better. Next was synthetic vitamin E and finally the strawberries. And they also, when they sacrificed the animals, um, they were able to see that there was less oxidative stress in their brains. Here's another animal experiment. We have... Um, these are beagles, um, so we have old beagles and then puppy beagles, and we have an antioxidant diet and the control diet. Um, and so they were six months on the diet, and after that six months, they found that the older dogs on the antioxidant diet outperformed the control diet older dogs in um, things having to do with cognitive performance and memory. 
um, the puppies, there was no difference after six months. So this is a slide just to show you, you know, this is an exhaustive of all the studies, but um, this is a, a large number of studies that I've listed here showing improved memory. The up, upward arrow means better memory if, um, on vitamin E diets, um, and then lower neuron loss and less oxidative stress. Um, so here are all of the human studies, prospective, remember. So they're looking at the development of disease. Uh, some of these are um, looking at dementia as an outcome. Others are looking at cognitive change over time. And um, so here we have the studies that looked at vitamin E, vitamin C, beta carotene, or flavonoids. What I want you to notice, a plus sign means that they found a significant protective association. So this is just in diet, this is not supplements, and you can see that almost every single study showed protective association from vitamin E into the diet. Not so with vitamin C, most of them, the dash means no association, as well as with dietary beta carotene, also no association. Flavonoids, there's just too few studies to really make a statement, but it looks encouraging. So now you're going to have a little statistics lesson, because I will give um, some data um, using what's called the relative risk. And simply, it's comparing the risk in the high uh, intake group. So this is the highest quintile of, say, vitamin E in the numerator, and the low, compared to the lowest quintile in the denominator. And so if I show you a relative risk that's about one, that means that they were equal and there's no association. We'll be looking for um, those below one where the high, there's a lower uh, risk of Alzheimer's disease in the highest quintile compared to the lowest quintile. So here um, are three of the studies that came out, the first studies that came out on vitamin E and Alzheimer's disease, risk of developing Alzheimer's. And we have that relative risk on the y-axis. And there's your uh, one of no association. And here we have vitamin E in the diet, not supplements, um, on the x-axis. So here's our study, the Chicago Health and Aging Project. We found a very strong protective relation. This is the highest quintile of vitamin E intake compared to the lowest. And this is the Rotterdam study in the Netherlands. They also showed a very strong association, the highest, um, I believe they had tertile uh, versus the lowest. What I want you to know, notice is that they, these populations had pretty, um, you know, a big range of vitamin E going up um, pretty high, whereas the uh, only negative study here, they found no association. That whole population had very low vitamin E intake in their diet. And so there probably was the, the population hadn't reached the level of protective benefit. So now here's the list of all the prospective studies. And then those are in white. And then there's three um, randomized trials in green looking at supplements in relation to disease. Uh, some of these are um, Alzheimer's disease as an outcome. Others are cognitive change. But you can see that almost no study found protective benefit for any of the supplements, whether it's a randomized trial or a, a prospective um, human study, um, observational study. I have asterisks two of them. One of them um, is uh, here, um, the Kang trial. That's a randomized trial. And then our Chicago Health and Aging Project here. Um, both had positive associations of the supplement, protective associations, but in a very special um, case. So um, here we have our Chicago Health and Aging Project. Here's time on the study um, on the x-axis, and here's um, the cognitive score on the y-axis. The pink line are people in the lowest quintile of vitamin E intake in the diet. And as you get higher and higher levels of vitamin E, you got um, a slower cognitive decline over time. Um, so the highest quintile is in green. And that's all diet. Now, when we looked at 
the interaction with vitamin supplement use and what you get in your diet, we found something interesting. So those people who were not taking supplements are this uh, purple line. They are not taking supplements in their lowest diet intake. And then the gold line, not taking supplements, but the highest diet intake. The supplement users are the pink line and the green line. So the pink line um, are people who had high food intake and were taking the supplement. The green line are people who had low food intake and were taking the supplement. So that, what that tells you is that if you already have a lot of vitamin E in your diet and you take a supplement, it's not going to do you any good. But if you have low intake in the diet and you take a supplement, it may um, improve your chances for maintaining better cogn cognition over time. So the other one that I asterisk was a randomized trial. It was a women's health study, and they followed people for almost 10 years, or they were taking um, 600 international units of alpha decopherol for 10 years. Um, and they looked at cognitive change, and overall in the population, they didn't find an effect. However, when they looked at people who had low vitamin E intake in their diets, this was 6.1 milligrams per day. The um, RDA is 15 milligrams, so that's quite a bit lower. Those people, um, this is a, a statistically significant finding here. Um, those people did have a protected benefit of the vitamin E supplement. Um, those people who had high, higher intakes did not. So that's level. Another difference between vitamin supplements and food is the form. So in all of these studies, uh, vitamin E was simply alpha tocopherol, high dose alpha tocopherol. But there's four different tocopherols, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And they all have different um, biologic activity. And there's also metabolites of those uh, called tocotrienols. So there's eight different tocopherol type forms in the food. Um, we don't know what kind of benefit. It's, they've never been tested in randomized trials. Um, so alpha decopherol is the most biologically active antioxidant nutrient. Um, and just recently, they, they do now manufacture uh, vitamin supplements that have the other tocopherols included. But in our diets, actually gamma tocopherol is the major form of tocopherol in the North American diet. And it has its own type of properties. It also has anti-amyloidogenic properties. That means it, uh, it uh, helps to decrease the accumulation of beta amyloid in the brain. Um, it uh, is an anti-inflammatory. Um, Alpha tocopherol has its own special protein to absorb in the body. Gamma tocopherol does not. And there's um, some studies to show that they work together in a, in, um, a very special way. Um, that actually, if you have higher levels of gamma tocopherol in your diet, it increases all of the tocopherols in the body and um, their antioxidant capacity. So that mixture seems to be the most um, important for pr protecting the brain and protecting the body. So here are some of the food sources of vitamin E. Oils, wheat germ, nuts, seeds, and um, whole grains then, and green leafy vegetables. So we looked at um, different types of tocopherol in relation to risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So here's those odds ratios or those relative risks I was telling you about. And we looked at alpha, gamma, um, delta, and beta tocopherols in the diet. And we found that um, alpha and in particular gamma and um, delta were associated with statistically significant lower risks of developing Alzheimer's. And actually, gamma was more effective this way than um, alpha, which was only marginally significant. So now moving on to fish and omega-3 fatty acids, and I probably won't be able to get to all the way through my talk, um, uh, given the time. When did we start?
Keep talking. OK, you can just tell me when to stop. So um, fish um, and omega-3 fatty acids include three major types. There's alpha-lenolenic acid, which we get in plant sources, and it's essential. The body doesn't make it. We have to consume it. And in, in the body, in mammals, it's desaturated and elongated to form EPA and DHA, which are very common in the, the media now. So many of you have probably heard of them. And you can obtain those directly from fish and other marine sources. So alpha-linolenic is found in wheat germ, nuts and seeds, uh, many oils, and um, what started a whole uh, body of literature, human milk. Human milk is very high in omega-3 fatty acids, and the first formulas that they manufactured didn't have them. So this stimulated a lot of animal models and other studies to try and understand why it was important. And um, what they found was that, indeed, that saying that fish is brain food is true. Um, the brain, the dry weight structure of the brain, the most important um, element is lipid material, makes up almost 60% of the dry weight material. And of the lipids, DHA is by far the most important. And it's found in the most metabolically active areas of the brain. And these uh, animal models found that it was very important for the structure of the neurons and for their normal functioning, and very important for neurocognitive development. So um, now uh, women in pregnancy are taking uh, vitamins that are very high in um, omega-3 fatty acids. Around 2000, the year 2000, the animal literature searched to, well, if it's good for the developing brain, what about the aging brain? And um, these studies found that as we age with oxidative stress, DHA decreases in the brain. But they found that giving DHA in the diet could actually increase it. Um, so diet seemed to be important, at least in, in animal models. Um, and found it in the aging brain to be very important for hippocampal nerve growth, uh, for the fluidity of the synaptic membranes, um, and also to decrease um, ischemic damage to neurons and inflammation. So there were other mechanisms for the aging brain that it was found to be important for. And this experiment um, is of rodents. They're older. Um, they, for 17 months, they were all put on a DHA diet. These are um, genetically altered mice to um, mimic Alzheimer's disease, and these were just normal mice. And then over time, after 17 months, they eliminated in one group DHA altogether. In the other, they just kept it the same, and in the other group, they increased it. And um, I find this really striking that in the group that they increased it, 90, uh, there was 90%, um, excuse me, in the group that they cut it out, there was 90% more synaptic loss and inferior memory compared to the group that had DHA supplementation. So we looked at this in our Chicago Health and Aging Project. Um, over a six-year period, we looked at change in cognition. And um, overall, there was a decline in cognition in the population. But those who consumed just one fish meal a week had a significant reduction in this decline um, compared to those who ate fish less than once a week. We also, this is again from our study, um, this is looking, here we have the relative risks again. Um, and the comparison group are people who never consume fish. And um, as you can see, with increased fish consumption, um, the relative risk is in a protective direction. This means that there was a 60% reduction in the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. But as you can see, there was no additional benefit with two or more fish a week in this study. And here are the other prospective epidemiological studies that looked at fish consumption and risk of developing Alzheimer's. Um, here we have this yellow line is the one that's no association. And you can see most all of the studies are in the uh, protective range. 
And if it doesn't cross one, that means it's statistically significant. Um, and you can see also, I've put here, these are just one fish meal a week. Very simple. So this is the one study that I'm going to show you that is um, what we call cross-sectional. The data on diet was obtained at the same time the data on who had um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, but what's interesting of these studies, um, that they were all um, developing world countries where fish consumption, um, rather than being associated with high socioeconomic status, was likely associated with low socioeconomic status. And this, um, they did a meta-analysis where they combined the results across all of these countries, and they found a statistically significant um, effect or association of fish consumption and uh, prevalent Alzheimer's disease. So there have been some randomized trials of fish oil supplements. There's been four. Um, and these dashes indicate that there was no association found. But there's two things um, that I want to draw your attention to. First of all, no trial restricted the people that were recruited into the trial to non-fish consumers. And if the benefit really is as low as one fish meal a week, everybody might already be at that protective benefit. We don't know. Um, and also interesting, almost all of them allowed everyone in the trial to eat at, um, up to three fish meals a week. So the designs of the trial may have made it uh, impossible to find an association with one fish meal a week if indeed there is a relation. And the, here, this just illustrates that point. So if everybody randomized into the trial is already at optimum functioning, then giving them a supplement, you're just not going to see a difference. What you want to do is recruit people with low vitamin E status or less than once a week fish meal consumption, and then you supplement them. And um, you're, if there's an association, you're more likely to see the benefit. So moving on to dietary fats. So um, you're probably well aware from the um, field of heart disease that the type of fat in your diet is very important for your cholesterol levels. If you have a high saturated fat diet and low unsaturated fats in your diet, you're going to increase the bad cholesterol, the LDL, and decrease the good cholesterol, the HDL. Um, and cholesterol is very central to Alzheimer's disease in ways that we're not really clear about. Um, cholesterol is in the uh, core of the all uh, amyloid beta plaques. Um, there are studies to show that um, the carrier for cholesterol, um, what's known as APOE4, is also involved in cholesterol. Um, and there's been recently some animal models to show that there is impaired memory with um, a, a diet that's high in saturated fat, increased uh, deposition of that amyloid beta into plaques, increased neuroinflammation, and also brain lesions. So there's a strong biologic mechanism. Um, there's also some other genes that have been um, associated with cholesterol transport, and this is actually a, 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 an old slide because now there's, what, half a dozen genes that are associated. Um, so cholesterol really seems to be central, and, and fats are central to cholesterol. Um, and there have been some studies that had populations at midlife and measured um, cholesterol in their blood, and they found that those with hypercholesteremia in midlife had three times the risk of developing Alzheimer's in late life. Um, so that's another piece of related evidence. Um, this is very interesting. It's um, what's called an ecological or correlation study. And it can't link individual diets to disease, and there's, there's problems with it, but it's just another piece of information. But here you see um, countries um, rated here um, by their prevalence of Alzheimer's disease in the country, and then their fat consumption um, for the population. And it's a very strong 
correlation. So the higher the uh, fat consumption consumed in the population, the higher the prevalence of Alzheimer's. Here are the prospective epidemiologic studies looking at fat composition in relation to cognitive change. And it's a busy slide, but you just need to focus on the consistency of the arrows. So we have saturated fat, trans fat, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, and then the ratio of unsaturated to saturated fats. So pretty darn consistent that the higher your saturated fat intake, the greater the cognitive decline. Um, trans fats, fewer studies looked at this, but also higher the trans fats, slower the, or greater the cognitive decline. And then poly and monounsaturated fats, um, very inconsistent, but um, going in the downward direction of um, higher levels will slow the, the cognitive decline. All right, moving on to the B vitamins. Um, now, the B vitamins um, are uh, very complex. It's going to be very difficult to try and uh, summarize for you what's going on, and, and it's really confusing even to the people who study it on a daily basis. We know that deficiencies in B12 can result in a neurologic syndrome that involves um, neuropathy, uh, tingling in the fingers. Um, it can result in some cognitive problems and dementia, depression, fatigue. It also can result in increased homocysteine levels, which has been related to an increased risk of Alzheimer's in some studies. Folate doesn't have its own neurologic syndrome. Um, but it also, a deficiency in folate can increase homocysteine levels. And we know that it's important for DNA repair. Now the B vitamins, they don't just operate singly. There's this very complicated metabolic pathway where they all work together. And um, so it's very hard to tease them apart. What further complicates their study is that there's such huge differences across populations in deficiencies in these nutrients. The United States, since 1998, has been fortifying our food supply with folic acid, the synthetic form of folate. So there's hardly any deficiency in the United States anymore. But there are in other countries. So when you're looking at studies in different countries or different periods, pre and post fortification, you can have findings all over the map. And you'll see that's kind of what happens. Um, the one consistency, though, uh, this is looking at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. These are all the prospective studies. Some of them looked in diet. Others looked in uh, plasma or serum, serum in the blood. Um, and for the most part, it's pretty consistent that uh, low folate intake is associated with increased risk of developing Alzheimer's. The studies haven't shown um, anything really going on with B12, um, but there is a problem with B12, and that is it's very hard just by measuring B12 in the blood to know who really has low B12 status. So um, I don't think that this is a resounding negative for B12 in Alzheimer's. Um, now, there's not very many studies that actually show the levels of the populations when they're reporting their results, which makes it difficult to interpret. But these three did report on um, the levels so that you could see that, indeed, there were people in their populations that had deficiencies in folate. These are the prospective studies that looked at B vitamins and cognitive decline. Um, much uh, more inconsistency. And in, you, in fact, for folate, you see some go down. Our study went up. The Framingham study also had an increased risk with higher folate. Uh, some of the studies showed that high B12 decreased cognitive decline over time. So when we looked at the levels in these studies, the two that uh, two of the three um, that reported that high folate or low folate increased cognitive decline actually 
you could see they had deficiencies in their population. Um, our study was done pretty much after the fortification. And the increased risk that we found with Alzheimer's disease, or excuse me, with cognitive decline was with supplement users. So they were getting folate in their food, they were eating fortified food products um, in the grains, and then they were taking a supplement that included even more folate. So that shows that perhaps too much folate, um, it could be a problem. Um, but too little folate could also be a problem. And this study is very interesting because they had blood levels. This is the Framingham study. And they found an interaction. They found that people who had low B12 status and they had high folate levels, those people had the fastest rate of cognitive decline. If they had normal B12 uh, levels in their blood, then there was no association of folate. So that's showing this interaction between folate and B12. And I think any older people definitely needs to have their doctor check their B12 status frequently because um, it's affected by medications. If you're on diabetic medications, that can affect your B12. Antacids affect B12. Just growing older affects the absorption of B12. So it's, um, and um, it's really important that it can affect so many things. Um, you can find if you don't know your B12 status, you go to the doctor, you get on a B12, that it can really make a remarkable difference in how you feel. So here are the randomized trials of B12 supplementation. Now, B12 neurologic syndrome is actually thought of as an irreversible syndrome. Um, these top two studies recruited people who were already cognitively impaired and then supplement them, supplemented them. These negative signs indicate that actually on the supplement, they um, decline more rapidly. Um, these other ones that show no difference uh, on supplementation, they're, uh, for the most part, normal populations. They didn't have problems with B12. And they gave them a supplement, and it didn't help them. Um, these two studies um, were of people with low B12. I highlighted them because they didn't give them an oral supplement. They gave them intravenous in, uh, um, uh, injections intramuscularly. So um, that avoids all the problems with absorbing B12 when, they, when you have the injections. Um, so probably they were, the supplementation really worked um, to correct their problem. There's three randomized trials that looked at folic acid in cognition. Um, one of them uh, was of cognitively impaired individuals and um, the, other, the other two were not. The only two that found association were in people who were recruited into the trial who had low folic acid status. So this goes to that point of level. If you already have optimum folic acid or folate in your diet, supplementing doesn't seem to be a benefit. So to summarize, um, foods to include in your diet are vegetable oils, nuts, whole grains, vegetables, and in particular, green leafy vegetables, fish, poultry, and berries. Those to avoid would be high fat dairy products, fatty meats, fried foods, and processed foods. So we all know it's hard to stay away from those things, but you should be more conscious of trying to do it more often than you do. Um, do we have time to, okay. So I um, put this at the end. Um, there have been some studies to look at diet patterns, and um, we actually came up with a new diet um, that I, want, I was hoping that I could share with you. Um, this is a study, again, in animals, and they had um, an enriched environment um, to, to try and improve cognitive status over time, and then they gave another group um, an antioxidant diet. Then they had a group that had both, and then 
the dogs that had neither. And you can see that the combination of the enriched environment and a good diet was superior, uh, followed by the antioxidant diet and then the enriched behaviors. Um, this is a study um, done in New York. Um, these people here, this black line, they had the slowest, um, what is this? This is uh, risk of um, getting Alzheimer's disease over time. Um, so this black line, they have the lowest risk over time, the lowest rate. They have high physical activity and um, they're, they rank highest in the quality of their diet. These people either had a good diet and low physical activity or low, high physical activity and a bad diet. So they were intermediate. And then these people have neither physical activity or diet. Um, this is data from our study. We looked at the Mediterranean diet, right? Because we've also looked at the DASH diet. Um, yes, so this is the Mediterranean diet. Um, so people in the top group of scores for the Mediterranean diet had the slowest decline over time. And this one we accounted for wine in there, and it didn't really make a difference. Um, <laughs> But we have very low wine drinking or any kind of alcohol drinking in our Chicago older population. And then this is just another, this is the Healthy Eating Index, which is by the USDA. And it's not designed for the, the brain, but you can see there's no difference over time among uh, people high on that diet and low on that diet. Um, so the Mediterranean diet really does um, suggest that it's um, beneficial. Um, fruits and vegetables, this is very interesting. There's been five studies that have looked at fruit and vegetable consumption. All of them find that vegetables are associated with slower cognitive decline over time. None of them show benefit from fruits. So all of our information on berries, because I'm sure most of you have heard about blueberries being um, protective and other berries, that all comes from animal models. Um, in particular, a Tufts lab that has looked at cranberries, blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, every berry, um, and have very striking results for showing how it protects the brain. There's been one published large study, the Nurses Health Study, that found that um, berry consumption was protective for cognitive decline. In our Chicago Health and, Pro and Aging Project, we also do. Um, it's not published, but we also have had that finding. So it seems right now that as a large group, fruits don't seem to be protective, but berries very likely are. Um, and we might find some other isolated fruits that are, like apples, I think, are another interesting uh, fruit. But um, right now, there's not data to support other fruits. Um, and this is just showing on a graph what I showed you in the previous table. This is our study. And uh, the blue line and the red line are the top quint quartile and quintile of vegetable intake. And by far, the strongest association was in green leafy vegetables. So here's our MIND diet, and I'm sorry the slide is so busy, um, but let me just uh, tell you. So we put in green leafy vegetables, we specified it, and we try uh, to make you have a high score if you had at least one a day, or six per week is the highest score. Um, two vegetable, or uh, uh, another vegetable serving of other types of vegetables. Berries, um, you got a high score. Nuts, a handful a day is, was optimal. Um, you use olive oil in your diet. You have um, less than one serving per day of butter or cream, less than one serving a week of high-fat cheese. Um, we did fish, just one fish meal a week because that's what the literature indicated. Um, and then lower on red meats and fast foods and pastries and sweets. And we made it uh, like less than five servings a week of pastries and sweets. So there were 15 components, and you could get a top score of 15. And here's the graph. Here's people in the top tertile. Um, they have the slowest cognitive decline compared to the lowest. 
Here's risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, a 56% reduction if you're in that highest tertile. It was highly statistically significant. We also looked at risk of death. Um, and the hazard ratio has the same type of interpretation as the relative risk. So under one is good. Um, so it was a lower risk of death. Um, also affected motor. Um, so the time it took you to get need help for activities of daily living was reduced. Uh, your gait was better over time, as well as tremors and rigidity. So we found the MIND diet, um, those 15 components was strongly associated with cognitive decline, Alzheimer's disease, developing disability, mortality. Um, I don't, uh, didn't show you the data, but we found it to be more protective than either the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet uh, by a considerable amount. But it's specific to the brain. Those other two diets aren't incorporating what we know about diet in the brain. Um, so right now what we need in this field is a randomized trial of a diet intervention to see if it can, uh, if you randomly assign people to these diets, if that reduces their risk and cognitive decline. So thank you. Give me about 10 minutes to ask questions. Okay. So there were two country by country studies. One was fats consumed in the population, and then the other was the comparison of the non-industrialized countries. Was that the one you were talking about? Um, unfortunately, that study, um, what I was interested in, um, because there was one outlier, I don't know if you noticed that, but um, how they cooked the fish um, I thought was important to try and understand that. Um, and they, they didn't have information on that uh, level. Um, it was very crude information about the level of intake. Um, it was. Uh, so perhaps in their future following of the population, they'll improve that information. Coconut oil. Um, well, coconut oil is billed for you know a lot of beneficial things. Um, there is no data that looks that I'm aware of. There, there could be an isolated animal study that looks at coconut oil in particular in relation to cognitive change or risk of developing Alzheimer's. So um, there's just not data to make any statements. On the far left, woman in the back. Sugar. So um, there has been one study that found um, an increased risk of mild cognitive impairment among people who had high carbohydrate in their diets. Um, but that has not been replicated. So um, I, I think that the evidence is very weak, and I'm wondering if um, some of it might be what clinicians always tell me, is that as their patients become more likely to be in the demented state, their um, desire for sweets increases. Is that true? So you wonder if maybe that study was picking up something in, uh, around that. But it's, there's not a strong literature to support. Uh, but what it does do, it can increase weight, which obesity is another risk factor for developing dementia. And it can fill you up on calories that you should be using to consume some of these other important foods. So, you know, there are the plant sources of um, omega, of the, the fish you get, I mean, excuse me, the, the omega-3 fatty acids you do get in fish, DHA. Um, so if you go for algae, and I'm sure there's um, uh, food products around marine life uh, that would be higher in omega-3s. There are plant sources, the... Um, 
conversion of the, the alpha-lenolenic acid to DHA, um, that's uncertain to what degree that um, reaches the brain. But you can consume it directly through, and I know that there's some non-fish uh, uh, omega-3 DHA supplements that are made from marine plant life. Not in the um, aging world. So I don't have any information to share with you. Um, I do know, and so you wonder how much of a, a publication bias there is. Um, very few studies have reported on grain products in relation to cognitive decline and dementia, which makes me think that they're finding negative associations, so they're not bothering to report them. Um, but there isn't data out there to make that contrast. Um, you know to be careful with folic acid. Um, and, you know, I guess I feel very... Um, strongly that you really shouldn't be taking a supplement unless you know that there's good reason for you to take it. Um, so I, for example, I've been a vegetarian for many years. I take a B12 um, intramuscular once a month. I take B12. I'm low in B12 and it made a tremendous difference. But I only did that after I found out I was low in it. I wasn't deficient, I was low. Um, so, and, you know, for the most part, um, the dietary levels are what are showing to be important. So concentrating on your diet, going to your doctor, having some blood work done to see what nutrients you might be deficient in. Another area might be if you get really sick. I think, you know, you need to think that you might, during that time, have um, gotten to be, and I don't think we should talk deficiency, but you maybe have insufficient levels of a nutrient or a set of nutrients. Maybe have um, blood work done then. Um, or just take a vitamin, multivitamin, for a short period of time to get you over the hump of recovery. Um, but I'm not a big supplement person, and largely the data don't support supplements for your, your normal, uh, healthy person. And thank you.